Hello and welcome to part two of the RSET webinar, Applications of GPM Imerge Reanalysis for Assessing Extreme Dry and Wet Periods. My name is Sean McCartney, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Amida Mekta. In part one of the webinar, we learned about iMERGE version 6 data products, how to explore and download the data using Giovanni, and how to calculate regional precipitation statistics using QGIS and spreadsheet software. In today's webinar, we'll be using iMERGE data with open source software to calculate the Standardized Precipitation Index, or SPI, to monitor wet and dry conditions. Each session of the webinar is divided into two parts. The first part being a presentation and demonstration on data access and analysis using iMERGE data for a very specific application. Part two of the webinar is provided as lab time for you to do hands-on computer-based exercises. Amita and I will be online to field your questions for the duration of the two hours. Homework assignments will be available for each of the three parts on the RSET website. Answers must be submitted via Google Form by the dates shown below. A certificate of completion will be awarded for those who attend all webinars and complete all homework assignments. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martin. As this is an advanced webinar, it is expected you have completed the required prerequisites offered through previous RSET trainings. These are the fundamentals of remote sensing, an overview and applications of iMERGE long-term precipitation data products. To complete the exercise for today's webinar, you will have to register an account on NASA Earth Data, install QGIS version 3.x, install Panoply, install Anaconda version 3.7, and for Windows users only, install Git Bash or another Bash shell such as Baboon or Sigwin, which you can run on your machine. The objectives for today's webinar will be to learn how to bulk download iMERGE data from NASA's Goddard Earth Sciences Data and Information Services Center, or GESDISC, determine how to calculate the Standardized Precipitation Index, or SPI, using iMERGE data for assessing extreme dry and wet periods, and finally to interpret the results using Panoply and QGIS. I will start off providing background information on the Standardized Precipitation Index, or SPI. We will then demonstrate the calculation of SPI using a case study for the state of Texas in the United States. You will learn how to bulk download iMERGE precipitation data from NASA GESDISC, pre-process iMERGE data using the NetCDF operator, or NCO, NCO is a suite of programs designed to facilitate manipulation and analysis of data stored in the NetCDF format. We will calculate SPI using an open source software package implemented in Python provided by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's National Integrated Drought Information System Program. We will then interpret the results using Panoply and QGIS. The remainder of the webinar will be provided to complete a similar exercise calculating SPI using the country of Mozambique as a study area. Step-by-step -step instructions are provided to complete the exercise, along with all the slides from today's webinar. If you encounter a problem installing the software, please look for a solution online or with your IT department. SPI is a result of research and work done by Tom McKee, Nolan Doskin, and John Kleist in the early 1990s at the Colorado Climate Center at Colorado State University. The outcome of their work was first presented at the 8th Conference on Applied Climatology held in January of 1993. It was used for estimating meteorological conditions based on precipitation alone, which is one of its major strengths. It was designed to quantify the precipitation deficit for multiple timescales, from sub-seasonal to interannual, and shows that it is possible to simultaneously experience wet conditions on one or more timescales and dry conditions at other timescales. SPI can be compared across regions with markedly different climates. In 2009, the World Meteorological Organization recommended SPI as the main meteorological drought index that countries should use to monitor 
and follow drought conditions. It is now the most commonly used indicator worldwide for detecting and characterizing meteorological drought. Some of the limitations of SPI are with precipitation as the only input, SPI is deficient when accounting for the temperature component, which is important to the overall water balance and water use of a region. SPI does not consider the intensity of precipitation and its potential impacts on runoff, stream flow, and water, water availability. It can provide uncertain results in arid regions with, with quasi-normal distribution of precipitation. In dry climates, the user should focus on the duration of the drought rather than on just its severity. The SPI values are interpreted as the number of standard deviations by which the observed anomaly deviates from the long-term mean for a normally distributed random variable and fitted probability distribution for the actual precipitation record. Negative SPI values represent dry conditions. The lower the SPI value, the drier a period of time is. Positive SPI values represent wet conditions. The higher the SPI value, the wetter a period of time is. SPI values lower than negative one indicate a condition of dryness, whereas SPI values greater than one indicate wetter conditions compared to a climatology. In most studies using SPI, the gamma distribution has been widely used as the gamma di distribution has been understood as the reliable fit to the precipitation distribution. The software we will use in this webinar computes SPI for both the gamma distribution and the Pearson 3 distribution. Interpretation of a one month SPI is, is similar to a map displaying the percent of normal precipitation for one month. It reflects relatively short term conditions closely related with short term soil moisture and crop stress. The three month SPI provides a comparison of the precipitation over a specific three month period with the precipita precipitation totals from the same three month period for all the years included in the historical record. It is important to compare the three month SPI with longer timescales. A relatively normal three month period could occur in the middle of a longer term drought that would only be visible at longer timescales. Looking at longer timescales would prevent a misinterpretation that any drought might be over. It reflects short and medium term moisture conditions and provides a seasonal estimation of precipitation. The six month SPI compares the precipitation for that period with the same six month period over the historical record. A six month SPI can be very effective in showing the precipitation over distinct seasons and may be associated with anomalous stream flow and reservoir levels, as well as good for monitoring agricultural impacts. The nine month SPI provides an indication of precipitation patterns over medium timescale. Droughts usually take a season or more to develop. SPI values below negative 1.5 for these timescales are usually a good indication that significant impacts are occurring in agriculture and may be showing up in other sectors as well. The 12 month SPI is a comparison of the precipitation for 12 consecutive months with the same 12 consecutive months during all the previous years of available data. It reflects long term precipitation patterns with SPI values tending toward zero unless a specific trend is taking place. SPI values of these timescales are tied to hydrological impacts to stream flow, reservoir levels, and even groundwater levels at the longer timescales. In some locations, the 12 month SPI is most closely related with the Palmer index. Here we are showing SPI labels and the relationship to the standard normal distribution. The labels denote meteorological dry conditions when the value is between negative one and negative 1.5, moderate dry conditions when the value is between negative 1.5 and negative two, and extreme dry conditions when the value is below negative two. The opposite is true for wet conditions. The percentages printed within the regions bounded by the dashed lines indicate the probability for SPI values to fall within that region only. For more detailed information on SPI, please refer to the references we've provided on this slide. 
For this demonstration, I will walk you through the process of bulk downloading iMERGE precipitation data from NASA GES disk, pre-process iMERGE data using the NetCDF operator, calculate SPI for the state of Texas using a Python script, and interpret the results using Panoply and QGIS. The demonstration and the subsequent exercise assume you have already registered an account on NASA Earth Data, installed Anaconda version 3.7, Panoply, and QGIS on your machine. First, we'll use a web browser to navigate to the NASA GES Disk website. Once there, in the search bar, we'll type in iMERGE. This takes us to a web page with a list of iMERGE version 6 level 3 products ranging from half hourly to daily to monthly. The list includes early, late, and final runs of the multi-satellite product. Since we're calculating monthly SPI, we'll select the iMERGE Level 3 Final Run product here. The link takes us to a page where we can read more about the iMERGE product, how it is created and calibrated, as well as a product summary at the bottom of the page. Since the study area for this demonstration is the state of Texas in the United States, we'll click on the subset Get Data link to refine our search even more. Under the Refine Date range, since we want the entire time series of monthly iMERGE data, we'll leave the default date range as it is. Final runs of iMERGE are delayed by about three and a half months, which is why the data set ends in September 2019. To subset our data spatially, we'll manually enter the longitude and latitude to create a bounding box around the state of Texas. For variables, we'll select precipitation, we'll leave the grid as default, and for file format, we'll select NetCDF and click Get Data. To confirm all the parameters we selected in the last step, we can use the drop down here to confirm the dataset, date range, spatial subset, variables, as well as the file format are all correct. We're then presented with a list of 234 links to download each monthly iMERGE dataset from June of 2000 until the present day. We could go through and individually select each of these hyperlinks to download the file separately, but that would take much too long. Fortunately, GESDisk provides information for bulk downloading data under the Instructions for Downloading link. First, you have to create an Earth Data account if you haven't done so already. Then in your profile, you'll need to authorize the NASA GESDisk Data Archive as an approved application. You can do that by clicking on this link here and following the directions that they provide. Once you've approved the application and agreed to the end user agreement, you'll have your Earth Data account linked to the GESDisk Data Archive. You can then verify your account is linked by downloading a dataset using the link that they provide here. Once you've verified everything, you can click on the download the list of links and save the text file to a directory on your desktop. I created a directory and named it iMERGE, and that's where I'll be downloading the, the text file. The text file includes links for 232 iMERGE NetCDF files, a document on how the iMERGE algorithm was created, as well as a README file. We can then follow the instructions to use wget or curl to bulk download the data using the text file that we just downloaded. wget works on both Windows operating systems as well as Mac operating systems. And since curl is installed with the Anaconda installation, this should be available to all users as well. Feel free to use whatever utility you are most comfortable using. We've also provided a zipped folder with this data on the RSET website for your convenience. If I navigate to my directory, I can see I've successfully downloaded the 232 files, and I've also created a backup file this is because we'll be changing the files that we just downloaded, and I want a backup of all the files since they will be changed, or in case they get corrupted, I have a backup. 
Now that we've successfully downloaded the time series of iMERGE precipitation data, we need to do some pre-processing pre of the files so that they can be read into the Python script provided by the National Integrated Drought Information System. First thing we'll do is open a bash shell and change directories to the iMERGE directory. There we'll explore the data with a command called ncdump. ncdump is a tool that generates an ASCII representation of a NetCDF file. We'll use the dash h in the command so only the header information is output containing the dimensions, variables, and attributes of the input file, but no, no data values for any of the variables. We can see that there are three dimensions, time, long, and lat, referring to time, longitude, and latitude respectively, followed by variables for precipitation, latitude, longitude, and time, as well as global attributes. To calculate SPI from iMerge with data using the Python code, we need to concatenate the 232 NetCDF files into one NetCDF file. To do that, we first need to make the time dimension in each of the iMerge files a record dimension. We'll be using the NetCDF operators for all of our pre-processing. First, we'll use the NCKS program and we'll loop through all of the NetCDF files in the iMerge directory and make time the record dimension. This takes a couple seconds to run, but once it's, con once it's finished executing, we will use the same ncdump command on the same file as before and we'll be able to see the change that was made. Now when we read the header file for the same NetCDF file before, we can see that time is now the record dimension, which is indicated by the unlimited uh, name. Once we've established our record dimension, we'll be able to concatenate all the NetCDF files using that record dimension into one file using the ncrcat program. This concatenates all of the NetCDF files in the directory, and it outputs a file that we're naming imerge underscore concat. Now if we run the ncdump tool on the file that we just created and we look at the header file, we can see that in time where there was only one file listed before, we now see that all 232 files are now listed and concatenated using the time dimension as the uh, dimension to concatenate them. The last step in pre-processing the NetCDF data uh, will be to change the order of dimensions of the file from time long lat to lat long time. This allows the file to run in the Python code provided by the National Integrated Drought Information System. We'll use the ncpdq program to do this. The ncpdq pro, uh, program, and in this code, will then change the order of the dimensions to lat long time and output a file that we're naming imerge concat ncpdq.nc4. Now when we run the ncdump command on the file that we just created and take a look at the header file, we can see that the list of dimensions is now lat long in time. Now that we've successfully pre-processed our NetCDF files, we'll navigate to NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System website to download the software. You can download the software by clicking on this link at the top of the web page. We'll save this to our desktop, and we encourage you to explore this website to learn more about the National Integrated Drought Information System. You can see there are a number of other climate indices that they provide software and code to be able to calculate. For this demonstration, we're only calculating the SPI climate indices. Once we've successfully un uh, downloaded the file, we will unzip it onto our desktop, and we will rename the directory that we just unzipped climate underscore indices.
Next, we will copy the iMerge folder and paste it into the climate underscore indices folder so that all of our data and all of our code is in one location. And next, for the code to run, we need to copy the output file that we just pre-processed, which again is iMerge underscore concat underscore ncpdq, and we need to place that in the example inputs directory located here. Next, we need to configure the Python environment for the climate indices root folder. We'll do so by following the uh, steps on the drought portal web page. But first, we're going to change directories to the root folder climate indices. Then we'll go to the drought portal and we'll follow all of the instructions for configuring the Python environment as well as running testing. Once we've configured the Python environment to the climate indices folder, for the sake of time, I've already done these steps, but it's important for you to go through and do them yourself. After we've done that, we'll change directories to the scripts folder and we'll run the following code, which will actually calculate the SPI at a three month scale. The web page gives details on what each of the options are in this code. This code will compute a three month SPI for both gamma and Pearson three distributions, outputting the results in the results directory as imerge underscore SPI underscore gamma, as well as iMerge SPI Pearson. Since the SPI calculation takes around 10 minutes to run, I went ahead and ran it ahead of time of this demonstration. At this point in the demonstration, we've successfully bulk downloaded iMerge monthly data, pre-processed the files using NetCDF operators, and calculated the three-month SPI. To view the results, we'll use both Panoply and QGIS. To view the results in Panoply, we'll launch the application and then we'll open the SPI file that was fitted to the gamma distribution. This file is located in the results directory as iMerge SPI gamma 03, indicating it's the SPI result fitted to the gamma distribution and it's a three month SPI. We'll select that file and then click open. The header information for the file can be found in the frame on the right similar to the results that we got from running the NC dump tool in our bash shell. To visualize the SPI results, we'll select the variable SPI gamma 03 and click create plot. When a window opens, leave the default as longitude latitude, uh, a longitude latitude plot and click create. Since we calculated a three month SPI, the first two months in our time series will not display. They were used solely for calculating the index. If you select any other month besides June and July from the year 2000, you will see the results displayed on the map. To better visualize the results, we'll click on the scale tab and select the scale range as negative three is the minimum and positive three is the maximum. Next, we'll select a different color ramp. So blue represents positive standard deviations and red represents negative standard deviations. We'll use the color ramp CB red, yellow, blue dot CPT. Next, we'll click on the map tab and change the projection to equirectangular regional. We'll then center the map on longitude negative 100 and latitude 30. We'll then click fix proportions. Now we'll compare the three month SPI in Texas for two separate years using the month of June which is one of the rainiest seasons of the year. We'll select June from 2011, which was a drought year, 
and compare it with June 2015, one of the wettest years on record. The three-month SPI for June of 2011 is doing a good job characterizing how dry the state was from April through June of 2011 compared to the same three-month period in the iMERGE time series. When we select the three-month SPI for June 2015, we see how much wetter this three-month period was compared to the same three-month period from 2000 to 2019. Panoply also provides the option of viewing the data as an array. as well as exporting the data as a CSV file. Next, we'll launch QGIS to visualize and interpret the results as well. Once we have the QGIS application open, we'll click on the Add Raster Layer icon, and we'll select the same file that we added to the Panoply application. This is the gamma distribution of the three-month SPI. When the image displays, we see something is obviously wrong. The image appears stretched on one of its dimensions. To troubleshoot the issue, we'll right-click on the layer and select Properties. We'll then select the Information button and view the extent. We can see from reading the extent that the latitude dimension is being displayed as the time dimension, which is seconds from January 1st, 1970. To correct for this, we use the bash shell and change directories to the results folder. Now we're on the NCPDQ program to reorder the dimensions. The following code changes the order dimensions to time lat long and outputs a file that we're naming SPI Gamma 03 Texas. Now when we add this raster layer, we'll first have to click on zoom to layer and change the symbology. We'll change the symbology to single band pseudo color. We'll choose the, the minimum to be negative three. And we'll change the maximum to be three. Next, we'll change the bands. We can select any band except for the first two for displaying on the map. Again, the first two months in the time series were used solely for calculating the SPI. We'll then click Apply and OK. Con to confirm the image is georeferenced correctly, I'll add a shapefile of Texas acquired by the Texas Department of Transportation. I'll also add a base map from OpenStreetMap. Now that we've confirmed that our image is displaying correctly, we'll now compare the same three-month SPI from June 2011 and 2015 that we compared using Panoply. First, I'll go back to the Symbology tab and this time, I'm going to select band 133. Band 133 represents the three-month SPI for June 2011. We can see low negative standard deviations across the state compared to the same three-month period for the iMERGE time series. Next, we'll change the time to 181.
This represents the three-month SPI for June 2015. This shows high positive values for standard deviations across indicating wet conditions for this three-month period compared to the same three-month period for the iMERGE time series. This concludes the demonstration. The rest of the webinar will be provided for you to complete the same steps for downloading iMERGE data, pre-processing the NetCDF files, calculating a three-month SPI, and displaying the results in Panoply and QGIS. Step-by-step -step instructions have been provided on our website, and both Amita and I will be available for the duration of the webinar to answer any questions you may have. We're getting some questions, and to, to answer those, uh, if you're looking for step-by-step -step instructions, they can be found on the presentation, uh, which uh, takes you step-by-step -step through this exercise, and that can be found at the link to the RSET webpage for this training. So feel free to go there and, and uh, either download or, or follow along uh, through the exercise using that presentation. The instructions are also found in the handout section of this webinar. So feel free to cl uh, click and down link, uh, download those links as well. Hello, everybody. I'm going to start addressing some of the questions that have been coming in. So thank you all for sending them. Uh, hopefully these pertain to more than one person, so uh, hopefully we can help you. Uh, the first question pertains to the daily iMERGE product, and the question is, uh, is it from uh, 12 o'clock universal time uh, to 12 o'clock, or is it from zero uh, universal time to zero universal time? And uh, the answer is uh, the iMERGE daily product is uh, days from January 1st, 1970 at zero, zero universal time. Again, that is days since January 1st, 1970 at zero universal time. In this exercise that we're working on, we are using monthly data. So that would be, uh, that would be uh, actually seconds since January 1st, 1970, zero, zero universal time. And Sudhir asked, uh, why are we using NCPDQ? Uh, and is this to rearrange the, uh, the dimensions? And yes, it is. Uh, we are using the NCPDQ uh, program to rearrange the dimensions uh, from time lat long, which is what is provided from NASA gets disk, to lat long time. And the reason we are doing this is because this allows the NetCDF file uh, to run in the software which is provided by the National Integrated Drought Information System. Another question we had uh, is uh, the videos of the last session and this one, when will they be available? And we actually already posted the recording from part one, which was on Tuesday, and you can find that uh, you can find the video to part one on the training page, uh, uh, the, the website for this training page. And the, the video from today's training will be posted within 24 hours also to the web page for the RSET website. Another question that we had are, why are we using the Standardized Precipitation Index, SPI, when there are a plethora of other indices? And it's a really good question. Uh, there are a lot of climate indices that are out there. And the reason we are using this for this demonstration and for the exercise uh, is one, we're focused on using iMERGE precipitation data. And because SPI uses precipitation only, uh, it makes it relatively easy to calculate compared to other climate indices. Uh, it's also more comparable across regions with different climates uh, than, say, the Palmer uh, Severity Drought Index. <clears throat> and it's also less complex to calculate than a lot of the other indices. But it is a good question. There are a lot of relevant climate indices that are out there, and we encourage you all to explore them. 
if I may also add, Sean, um, WMO also recommended like SPI is a quick way to look at meteorological drought, so uh, or weather related drought. And so SPI that way is is useful for meteorological drought and it's easy to calculate compared to other indices, as you mentioned. So um, since this webinar focuses on iMERGE, we decided to focus on SPI. And Great. the Thank next you, question is how yeah. does image compare to PRISM? Um, so that's a <laughs> good question. If you look at prerequisite and uh, Dr. George Hoffman's presentation, he talks about iMERGE validation. The, you should have that link. Um, PRISM, there is systematic comparison with PRISM has not been done, but I am going to um, give a reference here, uh, which um was a presentation in um, AMS meeting that you can look at that's for cold season and uh, it is known that for um, this is the reference you can look at um to see how iMERGE and PRISM data compare. Uh, this is mostly over the US. So with elevation and slope, of course, PRISM does better than iMERGE. Um, also in light rain conditions, especially in the elevation, elevated regions, PRISM and iMERGE, they have differences. But it, this is not true for all regions. Uh, this was just very specifically for elevated region. If you see this PDF, you will see that. Um, but what I I recommend there is also um, on, in, if you are familiar with uh, Google Earth engine, they it, it has Prism as well as iMERGE data sets that you probably can compare in your own region to see how they differ. And here is the here is the link for that. If you oh, quite a few precipitation data sets are available here, especially Prism and iMERGE version six, they are both there. So in your own region you may want to conduct your own uh, comparison because there is no one answer that fits everywhere as you will see from Dr. Hoffman's presentation also, which was the prerequisite, that uh, validation is also very local. In where there is, uh, in train is not complex um, because iMERGE final assimilates uh, rain gauge data, um, PRISM and iMERGE would compare uh, well, that's what I believe, but you, you probably want to validate in your own region. Um, for your own accuracy uh, assessment. Thank you. Thanks, Amita. Uh, another question that we had was uh, how to install <clears throat> the NetCDF4 and the NCO package from the Anaconda prompt, or is it necessary to use a bash shell? <clears throat> and the answer is you can install uh, the NetCDF4 package and the NCO package <clears throat> from either the Anaconda prompt or the bash shell. So that is up to you, both should work. Another question we had was the, <clears throat> the the NCKS program can be installed through the Conda install, uh, which is the uh, the line of the command which we provided in the slides for you. And the answer is yes. The NCKS program, along with all of the NCO operators, uh, are installed as a package when you install the NCO, uh, the Conda install dash C conda dash four gen CO, which is the command that we provide for you in the slide. So yes, that will be installed with that installation. And another question we received was, I noticed that the latency 
uh, the IE, the temporal availability of iMERGE product is about two to three months. If it's right, we can encounter some challenges in operational use. So to answer this question, the iMERGE product in which we are using for both the demonstration as well as the exercise today is the final run product, uh, which comes out roughly three and a half months after the observational month. So that's why we're downloading data up until September of 2019. But for those who are interested in an operational application of iMERGE data, they do have both a half hourly, so 30 minute, <clears throat> as well as a daily early and late run product. So separate from the final run, which is what we're using. And the early run product is released roughly four hours after the observation time. And the late run product is released roughly 14 hours after the observation time. So for those who are interested in near real-time applications of iMERGE data, uh, these would be the products that you would be probably the most interested in. But again, the final run product, uh, the monthly product is only available as a final run product. And because we're calculating monthly SPI, that's why we're using uh, this product specifically. Another question we have is, uh, I'm trying to connect my Earth Data account with GESDISC. However, I can't find the NASA GESDISC data archive. It only appears as GESDISC test data archive. What should I do? Uh, again, we would, uh, we would recommend you to go back to the, the information which is provided at the link and you should be able to uh, you know, link your Earth Data account with the GESDISC archive using those steps. Um, it should work. Um, okay, another question we had is, uh, if I have a case study where the precipitation is happening only during three months of the year, for example, March, April, and May, would I calculate SPI for these months only? Then how to calculate the duration of the consecutive drought and other drought characteristics? is annual SPI uh, would be indicative of that case. So in this scenario, uh, the case study or the, the study area is, uh, is a, an arid environment that receives three months of precipitation each year. And for this case study, where the precipitation only falls three months out of the year, uh, it is advised to calculate SPI at multiple time steps. That would be monthly, three month, six month, and annual. And when you calculate that, focus only on those months that where the where you're receiving precipitation. So in, the, in this case, that the person who posed the question, those would be the months of March, April, and May. You would focus specifically on those three months uh, when you were looking at the results from the SPI calculation. And that should show the duration of the anomaly for wet or dry periods uh, in, again, as a caveat, in arid regions of the world, SPI does not perform as well on the severity of the drought. So it's best to look more on the duration. And you'll be able to tell that through looking at it through those different time steps of monthly, three month and six month, as well as annual. Another question that we had has to do, and this has to do with pertaining to the part one of the, this webinar. It has to do with running the, the raster.series or r.series, uh, which is run in grass through the QGIS application. And what can I do to calculate the standard deviation of seasonal precipitation if the R.series 
tool is not working in QGIS. Um, first thing we, we can recommend is, is it could have something to do with the establishing a path to grass within QGIS. So maybe the first thing you could do is talk with somebody in your IT department and help them to troubleshoot the, uh, the issue of making grass compatible within QGIS. Uh, that would be the first way that you might want to troubleshoot this. Um, uh, or if that is not working, if you don't have access to somebody, say, in your IT department, um, if, if, our, if the uh, grass tool R.Series is not available, um, then you will have to use some other programming language. Uh, for example, you might want to use something like Python or R uh, to calculate the standard deviation. And for the exercise, you can skip this step uh, if, you, if you don't have access to the R.Series tool. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers that. I know some of you are having some issues troubleshooting grass in QGIS from part one. So next, GDDP download, uh, downscale data uh, are available. I'm not sure whether they're available from GS disk, but they are available on Google Earth Engine. And I think you can download them from AIMS, NASA AIMS. So there's a question here about how to install WGET. Um, that instruction is given on G GES disk page. When you go to data download options, um, WGET is a link. If you click on that, it will um, show you the steps how to do that. We had a question pertaining to the <clears throat> Python script to calculate SPI and if there are any requirements, uh, I'm assuming she's referring to uh, uh, any parameters from the NetCDF file that you pre-processed uh, to use as an input. Uh, for example, uh, like time units, precipitation units, and a name of variables. And again, once you've pre-processed the uh, concatenated and rearranged the, uh, the dimensions using the NCO commands, uh, that file should run in, in, the, in the script that we provided. And to understand what those parameters within that script are referring to, I would ask that you go to the web page for the National Integrated Drought Information System. And if you scroll down on that page under the section uh, titled Indices Processing, uh, it gives information on what uh, each of those parameters is uh, referring to in that script. So hopefully that clarifies that question. Again, uh, we want to repeat that this today's recording of the webinar will be available on the RSET webpage, uh, the training page for for this um, for this specific webinar uh, within 24 hours. So we encourage you to uh, again come back to the RSET website uh, and explore the part two, and you can rewatch this recording as well as uh, the recording from part one which has already been uploaded to the web page. And if you want, you can uh, view some of what is in store in part three, which would be next Tuesday. So again, um, if you want to view today's recording, uh, go to the RSET webpage by tomorrow and we will have uploaded it. We've also provided the homework for parts one and for part two, and they are now accessible if you go to the uh, the training page for this webinar. Uh, again, both homework assignments are now accessible. So please feel free to um, start on them uh, when you have the time. So question 20 is, what are the relative effects of short and long-term drying trends in satellite-based rainfall products 
uh, special resolution. So yeah, of course, special resolution is in here is about 10 kilometers square. So it's not super high resolution. So you can only see trends within that region. Uh, these data are 20 years long. So you would, um, the, whatever trend you see in that could be part of interannual variability could be part of that too. So you have to keep that in mind, yes because the time series is about 20 years long. So you will be able to see uh, the variability and trend. Uh, you probably um, not long enough, long enough time series to, to be able to attribute it to any particular cause. Um, for You can clearly see El Nino La Nina type variability. And so that's short term drying that you can clearly see in, in these records. Um, but trend, it's a little tricky. I, for 20 year um, period, it could be long term multi decadal variability that could appear as trend also. So, yes, that is something to keep in mind. So the st starting date for iMERGE um, for this data set is June 1st, um, 2000. That's when it started. So the, for this long-term data set that we are talking about, it's the 1st June 2000. 22 is about uh, standard deviation range. Um, if you were able to, to run raster series, R dot series, and you had a standard deviation map, then you would see minimum and maximum value. That's the range that we're asking for. There's a question, uh, which other parameters other than precipitation can be used for drought monitoring and mapping? Uh, some other products which are derived from remote sensing data, which can be used for drought monitoring are evapotranspiration as well as soil moisture products, which are two important parameters for drought monitoring and mapping. And I would like to take the time now to promote a, an RSET training that will be happening in April that will be specific entirely to uh, the remote sensing applications for agriculture and food security. And we will be discussing both of those products, evapotranspiration and soil moisture, in that training. So we hope you will stay tuned for and, and if you are not, please get on the RSET listserv so that we can notify you on the exact dates of that training, which will be held in April.
Well, since we're past the hour, we will now be concluding the part two of the webinar applications of GPM eye emerge reanalysis for assessing extreme dry and wet periods and for calculation of SPI based on eye emerge to monitor wet and dry conditions. I would like to thank my colleague Amita Mekta, as well as my colleagues at RSET, Brock Blevins, Selwyn Hudson Odoi, and Jonathan O'Brien for contributing to this webinar. Next Tuesday, we will be concluding this three-part webinar with GPM iMERGE training, which will be a comprehensive final part where you'll be applying the skills that you learned in parts one and two and applying them to a study area that you will select. Again, all the homework assignments for all three sessions are available on our training page and Homeworks for part one and part two are already online and accessible. Please submit these answers via the Google form, which you can find linked on that same web page. As a reminder, the due dates for all three homework assignments will be next month on February 11th for part one, February 18th for part two, and February 25th for part three. The contact information provided here is for Amita and myself. And we want to thank you all for joining us today. We hope that you got something out of this. And again, if you have, if you want to go back and refer to the video, it will be online by tomorrow. So thank you all for joining us and we hope to see you next week for part three. Just, just a suggestion that uh, in part three, since you will be working on the area of your own interest, you may want to have a shapefile or a region already decided when you come in to the webinar. And thank you for attending this session. We'll see you on Tuesday.